Before British colonization, Australia was already home to diverse groups of people with rich, ancient cultures. These were the Aboriginal Australians who lived across the mainland and surrounding islands, including Tasmania, and the Torres Strait Islanders who lived in the islands between Queensland and Papua New Guinea. Each of these groups carried their own unique traditions, languages, and ways of life that had evolved over tens of thousands of years. According to the 2021 Australian Census, around 812,728 people identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, which is about 3.2 percentage of Australia's total population. Most identify as Aboriginal, with a smaller percentage as Torres Strait Islander, and some belonging to both groups. But the numbers don't tell the full story. The government actually estimates the total indigenous population to be closer to 983,700, or about 3.8 percentage of the population. Today, it's common to hear terms like First Nations or First Peoples of Australia. Many indigenous Australians prefer these terms over the more generalized indigenous because they feel it better respects their specific cultural identities and histories. Since 1995, Australia officially recognizes the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags, symbols of pride and resilience for these communities. Now, how long have indigenous Australians been here? Well, the oldest human remains found in Australia, known as Mungo Man and Mungo Lady, date back about 40,000 years. But that's just part of the story. Indigenous Australians have most likely been on this land for at least 65,000 years. Cut off from the rest of the world for millennia, they developed an incredibly diverse range of regional cultures, languages, arts, and even unique tools like the boomerang. They impacted the land with their own methods of farming and hunting, adapting to the environment in ways that are still visible today. While these groups share some common cultural elements, the differences between them are just as fascinating. For example, the 2022 census reported over 160 indigenous languages still in use, though many are endangered. Some estimates say that at the time of European colonization, over 250 aboriginal languages existed. Before European arrival, indigenous Australians numbered anywhere from a few hundred thousand to as many as three million. Most lived in the southeast along major rivers, like today's population centers. The British settlers came in with instructions to get along with the aboriginal population, but things quickly turned tragic. Diseases brought over by Europeans decimated indigenous communities, especially with a deadly smallpox epidemic. Frontier violence and competition for land led to more loss, changing the landscape of indigenous Australia forever. Then, from the 19th to the mid-20th century, many indigenous children, particularly those of mixed heritage, were taken from their families in an attempt to assimilate them into the majority white culture. This practice, which is now widely recognized as a violation of human rights, was later termed genocidal in the government's Bringing Them Home report in 1997. Indigenous Australians have also faced a complex history with terminology. The word Aboriginal dates back to the 16th century and was first used in Australia in the late 1700s. Today, however, Aborigine is generally avoided due to its colonial undertones, while terms like First Nations, First Peoples and First Australians have grown in popularity, showing a broader respect for cultural identity. And now let's explore the complex regional and community identities among Aboriginal Australians. The term Aboriginal Australians covers diverse groups across mainland Australia and associated islands, except for the Torres Strait Islands. Each community is unique, often identified by their own language, location, or even the names given to them by neighboring groups. Over time, communities have shifted, overlapped and evolved, especially after colonization. Today, community is a word used to describe groups bound by shared kinship, language, or a strong sense of place or country. Aboriginal Australians might connect to several communities simultaneously, adapting or even discarding certain identities as they go. 
Each group might go by several names, often spelled differently in English. For example, the Anang live in parts of South Australia, Western Australia, and the Northern Territory. In Central Australia, the Urant, in New South Wales and Victoria, Cori or Kuri, and in Queensland, variations like Guri and Mori are used. Then, we have the Tiwi people in the Northern Territory's Tiwi Islands, and the Palawa in Tasmania. The larger Aboriginal communities include groups like the Pityantia Tiara, Ururant, Luritja, and Warlpiri in Central Australia. Across millennia, hundreds of Aboriginal groups have thrived in Australia, each with unique languages, beliefs, and cultural practices. At the time of British arrival, more than 200 distinct languages were spoken. In Tasmania, it's believed that Aboriginal ancestors crossed over roughly 40,000 years ago via land bridge. Their population, once estimated between 3,000 and 15,000, might have been much larger. Indigenous oral traditions and recent genetic studies hint at population declines due to diseases brought by British and American sealers even before settlement. Tasmanian Aboriginal numbers dropped drastically between 1803 and 1833 due to disease, warfare, and settler actions. The population was reduced to just around 300. There's been heated debate for over a century about whether this decline could be considered genocide. Some researchers, like Benjamin Madley, argue that based on the UN definition, this catastrophic event qualifies as genocide. Truganini, who passed away in 1876, is often believed to be the last full-blooded Tasmanian Aboriginal person, though later, Parliament recognized Fanny Cochran Smith, who died in 1905, as the last. Aboriginal people are thought to have arrived in Australia over 49,000 years ago, with some evidence suggesting human activity as far back as 65,000 years at sites like Majid Bibi in northern Australia. Genetic studies support an arrival range of 50,000 to 70,000 years ago, with early findings like Mungo Man, a 42,000-year-old skeleton, adding to the story, though questions about his direct relation to Aboriginal Australians remain debated. The indigenous custodians of Mungo National Park believe the remains are linked to today's Aboriginal people, but more testing is unlikely, as they generally reject further intrusive studies. The origins of Aboriginal Australians suggest a single, organized migration, with a founder population of around 1,000 to 3,000 people, indicating deliberate and coordinated sea travel. Aboriginal people coexisted with Australia's now extinct megafauna, and some evidence hints at early fires set by humans in southwest Victoria, possibly dating back 120,000 years. More research is needed to verify such findings. Aboriginal Australians share a close genetic relationship with other oceanic populations, like Melanesians, and show genetic ties to groups in East Asia, like the Andamanese, as well as to ancient ancestral South Indians. Genetic data suggests their lineage split from East Asians, forming a unique Australasian lineage. Some groups show signs of interbreeding with Denisovan, an archaic human group, around 44,000 years ago before Australia separated from New Guinea. There's also evidence of a significant genetic influx from India around 4,000 years ago, coinciding with tool and food processing changes in Australia. By the time Europeans arrived, the Aboriginal population was divided into about 250 nations, each with its own language. It's estimated that their population ranged from around 314,000 to possibly over a million people, with the highest densities in areas like southern and eastern Australia. And British exploration of Australia started with William Dampier in 1688 and again in 1699. He wasn't exactly impressed with what he saw on the west coast of Australia, neither with the landscape nor the people. Fast forward almost a century and we have Captain James Cook, who charted the East Coast and claimed it for Britain under King George III. Cook saw things differently. He was fascinated by the land and intrigued by the people, writing that while some Europeans might view the indigenous Australians as the most wretched people on earth, he thought they were actually happier than many Europeans. 
They didn't have the same conveniences or luxuries, but also didn't seem weighed down by class inequalities or the pressures of modern life, living in a kind of peaceful simplicity. However, things weren't entirely smooth. At Botany Bay, two men resisted Cook's first attempt to land. One even threw a rock, which led Cook to fire a musket loaded with small shot that hit but didn't seriously injure the man. That shield, still bearing some of the shot from Cook's musket, was taken back to England and is now kept at the British Museum. Later, when Cook's crew was stranded near modern Cooktown in Queensland, he spent time with the Gugiemuthur people. Relations were generally good, but a fight broke out over turtles that the British had taken from the river. This tension was eventually settled when an elder presented Cook with a broken-tipped spear, marking a sort of first act of reconciliation. This encounter is still commemorated today by the Gug Yimuthur. Cook's positive impressions of the eastern coast eventually led to Britain's decision to establish a penal colony at Sydney in 1788. Governor Arthur Phillip, who led this first fleet, had instructions to make peace with the indigenous people and avoid any notion of British superiority. The British didn't make any formal treaty with the aboriginal communities like they did in North America or New Zealand, which was unique to Australia. Some of the men who arrived had previous experience with Native American tribes, and they brought assumptions about indigenous leadership structures that didn't really apply here. Soon, British control spread, with settlements springing up across the continent over the following decades. Tasmania, Victoria, Queensland, Western Australia, and South Australia each had their own timelines for British settlement. The Northern Territory, though, saw several failed attempts before Darwin was established as a permanent settlement in 1869. One of the immediate and devastating impacts of British arrival was disease. Smallpox, likely carried by the newcomers, broke out among the Daruk people around 1789, wiping out up to 90 percentage of their population. Whether the epidemic originated with the first fleet, came through contact with Malkasan fishermen, or was chickenpox instead of smallpox is still debated. But the result was the same. Tragic loss on an unimaginable scale. Other diseases, like measles and tuberculosis, followed, and aboriginal communities had no immunity. The British also took over lands and water resources, decimating natural food sources like kangaroos as settlers converted areas for livestock grazing. Aboriginal people suffered in other ways too, facing violence, forced labor and sexual exploitation. Some British convicts even escaped and integrated into aboriginal communities. The British government also began to rely on aboriginal trackers, who were highly skilled at navigating the Australian landscape. By the 1860s, Tasmanian aboriginal skulls were in demand for scientific research, and despite her wishes, the remains of Truganini, one of the last Tasmanian aboriginals, were exhumed after her death and displayed. A long campaign finally brought her remains back to Tasmania in 1976. Many place names across Australia bear the marks of colonial discrimination, such as Mount Jim Crow in Queensland, now renamed to Mount Baga. Protection laws and policies controlled nearly every aspect of Aboriginal lives, from wages to where they could live. During much of the 19th and 20th centuries, these laws placed Indigenous Australians under the oversight of protectors and Aboriginal protection boards, controlling even their basic income and rights. And then there was blackbirding, a form of slavery affecting both Aboriginal Australians and Pacific Islanders, who were kidnapped and forced to work in brutal conditions, particularly in the pearling industry. Pregnant Aboriginal women were particularly targeted for this labor because their lungs were believed to have greater capacity. Aboriginal prisoners were sent to Rottnest Island, where they faced harsh, forced labor, and many of them died there. From around 1810, Aboriginal people were moved onto missions run by churches and the government. This protection approach eventually morphed into a policy of assimilation in 1937, aimed at absorbing those of mixed descent into white society. As a result, a growing number of Aboriginal children were forcibly removed from their families, placed in institutions, or fostered out to non-Indigenous families. 
This attempt to erase Aboriginal culture and identity marks a dark chapter in Australia's history, and the brutal realities of colonization didn't end with the initial waves of settlers, they carried on for generations. From the 1800s all the way to the early 20th century, conflict between the colonists and Aboriginal communities was ongoing. These clashes, often referred to as the Frontier Wars, were devastating. In places like Queensland, the violence was intense, with both civilian hunting parties and the native police targeting Aboriginal resistance. Tragically, the native police was a force made up of Aboriginal men, forced into service and directed by government officers to quell their own people. Historians at the University of Newcastle have been mapping out these events, and as of 2020, they identified nearly 500 sites where massacres occurred, with over 12,000 Aboriginal lives lost compared to just over 200 colonists. But these numbers may only scratch the surface. Many killings went unrecorded or were deliberately hidden, making it hard to determine the true scope of the violence. Some research even estimates that up to 65,000 Aboriginal people were killed in Queensland alone. These were not just isolated incidents, they had a lasting impact. Survivors were often left in dire situations, with entire communities weakened, unable to fully support themselves or defend against future attacks. For some, it didn't end with violence. The policies that emerged later, like the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their families, what's now called the Stolen Generations, were devastating in another way. Justice Ronald Wilson, in his Human Rights Report, argued that these forced removals met the definition of genocide. It wasn't about physical extermination alone but the destruction of a culture and a community's way of life. Children taken from their families were often raised unaware of their heritage, cut off from their cultural roots, which the government at the time saw as civilizing them. In 1938, on what was supposed to be a national celebration of Australia Day, over a hundred Aboriginal people protested the event, marking it instead as a day of protest and mourning. The fight for rights continued through the 20th century, with Indigenous Australians rallying for recognition, land rights and fair treatment. The 1967 referendum was a huge victory, granting the federal government the power to create laws benefiting Aboriginal people and counting them in the national census. Then, in 1992, the High Court's decision in the Mabo case finally acknowledged indigenous land rights, rejecting the concept of terra nullius, the idea that Australia had been empty land before British settlement. This was a monumental shift, recognizing the cultural and legal claims indigenous Australians had always held over their land. But perhaps one of the most significant moments came in 2008 when Prime Minister Kevin Rudd issued a formal apology for the suffering caused by the stolen generations. It was a powerful step toward reconciliation, acknowledging the harm done to indigenous communities by government policies and offering a way forward. The journey toward justice and recognition continues as Australians confront these hard truths and work to heal the wounds left by colonial history.